Have you ever experienced being in bed with a partner, making out with them, touching them, getting really excited about maybe having sex, but you are just not getting wet or hard? Or what about the reverse when you're not thinking about sex or interested in sex at all, but your body just starts responding and you notice yourself getting wet or hard? You are not alone. This mismatch between your brain and your genitals is called genital non-concordance. So this is a concept that the brilliant sex educator Emily Nagoski explores in her book, Come As You Are, and also I got to interview her for my podcast, which was such an amazing conversation. But genital non-concordance is something that I have been thinking about a lot recently. It's something that I've been navigating with sex and intimacy post-birth, but also something that I've experienced throughout my sexual life. So I thought it might be helpful for others if I made a video explaining what it is, why it happens, why it might be impacting your sex life, if there's any Anything that we can do about it and just nerding out about some sex science. So let's dive in with some very important questions. Why am I not getting wet? Why is that making me hard? So we need to start with some super sexy definitions so that we can all get on the same page. Genital response. This is an automatic physiological reaction. The vagina getting wet, the vulva getting engorged, and the penis getting hard. Subjective arousal. This is feeling mentally turned on. So our brains liking something sexually. Sexually relevant stimuli. This is anything that links to or makes our brains think about sex. This can be literally anything from a sensual advert, seeing a dick-shaped cloud in the sky, talking about sex with your friend, or even just watching this YouTube video. This is sexually relevant stimuli. Mm -mm -mm. Sexually appealing stimuli. This is sexually relevant stimuli that is subjectively arousing to us specifically. So sexually relevant? That's about sex. Sexually appealing? That's about sex and I like it sexually. So genital non-concordance happens when our genital response and subjective arousal are out of sync with each other. When there's a disconnect between our physical reaction and our experience of pleasure and desire. It's when your mind is saying no, but your body is saying yes, or vice versa. So maybe you're in bed with a partner and you're making out and you're touching each other and they're whispering into your ear about what they wanna do to you and you are super into it and you reach over and grab a condom but you discover that you are not hard. That is you being subjectively aroused even though your genitals aren't responding. And it can be really frustrating and cause a lot of anxiety. Or maybe you're watching some porn and there's some fisting and you find yourself getting wet, even though the idea of somebody shoving their entire hand and arm up your vagina really scares you. This is your genitals responding to sexually relevant stimuli even though you don't find it subjectively arousing and the porn isn't sexually appealing to you. Just another note on language. In my podcast with Emily Nagoski, she talked about how scientists and sex researchers often use the term aroused to mean genital response. This is because of how the term aroused is used in non-sexual contexts. Think like my senses are aroused, meaning activated or awakened. But language can be really confusing and often what the scientists use is not how it's understood by the general public. And also often different terms are being used interchangeably but for the sake of this video, aroused means your subjective arousal, being turned on, liking something, and we'll use genital response to specifically mean what is happening to your genitals. So speaking of sex researchers, how do they actually go about measuring genital non-concordance? Watching porn for science, or how do we actually study these things? The way that we measure genital non-concordance hasn't really changed much since it was first researched in the 1970s. And if you watch the Planet Sex documentary on BBC, you'll see that Cara Delevingne actually took part in some of this research. Basically, researchers ask participants to watch some porn clips whilst their genitals are being monitored. Participants are also given a dial or some other way to measure their subjective arousal to the clips from low to high. So you do get to watch porn for science, but it might not be very sexy. The porn clips will all be different. Some romantic, some violent, some that align with your sexual orientation and some that don't. And some that aren't even human, such as bonobos mating. For people with penises, they record their arousal to each of the clips while a strain gorge on their penis measures their genital response. For people with vulvas, participants insert a vaginal photoplethysis 
thermograph, a mini torch about the size of a tampon which measures vaginal blood flow. So that's how we get the data on genital response and subjective arousal, but what does the data actually show us? Especially when it comes to breaking down that data by gender. Why are we always bringing up the patriarchy? Or why is there a gender slash sexuality split? Research shows that there's roughly a 50% overlap between how much blood flows to cis men's genitals and how turned on they feel. So that's a 50% overlap between their genital response and their subjective arousal. Meaning that cis men experience genital non-concordance roughly half of the time. Cis men's genitals will also react most strongly to porn clips that match their sexual orientation. So a gay cis man's penis will react most strongly to porn features two men, and he will report the highest level of subjective arousal to it. Meanwhile, there's only about a 10% overlap between cis women's genital response and their subjective arousal, so they're experiencing genital non-concordance 90% of the time. That number is honestly still bananas to me. That is such a big percentage. There is no statistically significant relationship between a cis woman's genital response and how subjectively aroused she feels. Her genital response will be similar no matter what porn she is watching. It might match her sexual orientation, it might not. Specifically, research suggests that this 10% overlap is for straight cis women. Bisexual and lesbian cis women experience less genital non-concordance than straight cis women. We don't really know why, but it's important to note that cis women aren't broken just because we may experience so much genital non-concordance. In fact, Emily Nagoski points out that if we didn't live in a world where male is seen as the default, we might question why cis men's arousal is so concordant, rather than thinking it's an issue with cis women. Now, genital non-concordance is very normal. It happens to everyone to some extent, and we don't really know why our brains and our genitals can be so out of sync. But we definitely know some things that can affect our genital response and our subjective arousal in general. And a lot of them come back to the cis-heteropatriarchal ideas of what sex should be. Cis women are told that they should get wet, that they shouldn't need lube, and that their pleasure comes second to their partners. There's also the expectation that we will be able to come from penis in vagina penetration every time, but I have a whole other video unpacking that. And of course, the patriarchy doesn't just screw over women. Cis men also get landed with a whole bunch of unrealistic ideas of how they're supposed to perform in bed, such as being a rock hard and being able to last for ages. And that kind of pressure is not sexy. Worrying that you're not going to be able to get hard or get wet, that you're going to come too soon or not come at all, all of that is not conducive to having good sex. And that worry and stress can make it even more likely that your brain and your body will be out of sync. Society puts so much pressure on how our bodies should respond and how we should perform in bed, it actually kind of makes sense that our bodies aren't always meeting these ridiculous expectations. Now talking about harmful sex myths, let's unpack a big one that research about genital non-concordance brings up. So all women are a little bit bisexual, right? Or how the data can be misinterpreted. So sex research shows that cis women's genitals respond similarly to porn regardless of sexual preferences. And some people have taken this to mean that all women are bisexual. In a 2015 study, the lead researcher said, even though the majority of women identify as straight, our research clearly demonstrates that when it comes to what turns them on, they are either bisexual or gay, but never straight. No, just no. Getting wet or hard in response to something you see doesn't mean that you are interested in doing that thing. Our genitals can respond to something that we don't find subjectively arousing. And as cis women have an especially high rate of genital non-concordance, that means that there is a lot of stuff that our genitals find sexually relevant, but we don't find sexually appealing. Which for straight women can include porn of women masturbating. Even outside of taking part in an experiment to research genital non-concordance, straight women might watch lesbian porn or porn featuring queer women because it puts a greater emphasis on women's pleasure than mainstream porn, most of which is made for straight men and might not be appealing to anyone else. The fact that people are still drawing these conclusions and writing these kinds of headlines 
shows how society doesn't trust women to know our own bodies or what we want. It's really infantilizing to be told that we're into something because we're getting wet or hard. Or be told that we can't possibly want sex right now because our genitals aren't responding. How do you know if your partner is actually turned on if you can't use their genitals as a gauge, you ask? You ask them! Yay! <laughs> Scientists do not know who we want to have sex with more than we do, and women aren't lying about what we find subjectively arousing. Also, something can subjectively arouse us without wanting to act on it. You might be subjectively aroused by the idea of spanking, but that doesn't mean that you want to add it to your sex menu. You can find it hot, but not want to act on that arousal for your own personal sex life. But unfortunately, it's not just scientists and journalists who try and tell us that they know what we're into better than we do. I want to give a quick content warning for sexual assault in this next section, and there'll also be timestamps in the description if you want to skip this part. Please do take care of yourselves. Why did I get wet if I didn't like it? This disconnect between sexually relevant things and sexually appealing things means that sometimes we can find our bodies responding to things that we find gross or disturbing or unethical. This means that if you're reading an article that gives some unnecessarily graphic description of sexual assault, you may find your genitals responding to those words. The detail is sexually relevant, even though sexual assault is appalling to you and not at all sexually appealing. This is why when people are being sexually assaulted, their genitals can still respond, like getting wet or hard. It's not uncommon for people to orgasm while being raped, and that doesn't mean that they were enjoying themselves or that they wanted it really. It just means that their genitals responded to something that was sexually relevant. Orgasm is a physiological response that happens in our bodies, and mental subjective arousal isn't necessary for it to happen, and it may not even feel pleasurable. This leads to a whole load of misogynistic and false ideas in rape culture. Ideas like if a person is wet or hard, then they do want sex, really. And if they say no, then they're just playing hard to get. No, 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 absolutely not. People have even used the fact that someone's genitals might respond and they might even orgasm while being sexually assaulted to try and prove that it wasn't assault and that there was consent. But genital response does not equal consent. There is actually some research that suggests that people with vulvas have evolved so their genitals respond this way in these situations to avoid genital injury, which is honestly horrifying. It can be really distressing to feel your genitals responding to something that you find disgusting and scary. But it doesn't mean that you secretly want it and are in denial about it and you shouldn't feel any shame about having that response. I know it's easier to say this than to believe it, but our genitals acting this way is just a normal part of being a human and having a body. This idea that if your genitals are responding, then you must be subjectively aroused, not only feeds into rape culture, but it can also cause misunderstandings when you're having sex. It's a myth that so many mainstream depictions of sex perpetuate. And it's a myth that we might wish was true, because it means that we can skip all of the embarrassment and awkwardness. And yes, I am not denying that it can be really hot reaching down into your partner's underwear whilst making out and being like, oh my god, you're so wet, or oh my god, you're so hard. But just because their genitals are responding doesn't mean that they necessarily want to take things further. In Fifty Shades of Grey, there are numerous scenes where Christian Grey doesn't ask Anna if she likes the sex or the BDSM that he's introducing her to. He just tells her that she does because her genitals responded. All of the red flags. And of course, it goes the other way too. Just because your genitals aren't responding doesn't mean that you're not subjectively aroused and that you find your partner hot and that you want to have sex with them. You are the expert on your own body and whether or not you want to have sex. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Otherwise. And this is why it feels like I'm banging on about communication in every video. It's so important to talk to your partner about what you want and what feels good and what you're into and to ask them to share those things with you too. None of us are mind readers and we can't rely on genital response to tell us what our partners like. A note about sex science research. Now, you know how much I love getting nerdy and talking about sex research, but it can be really frustrating with how little is actually out there. There is quite a lot of stigma in the scientific community about doing research into sex, but it is so important. And the research that has been done often excludes groups of people entirely. For example, I've been talking about the genital non-concordance in cis men and cis women, but 
what about trans people? Luckily, I actually know a trans person who has done some research into this exact topic. I asked Dr. Jamie Rains to share his research. You may recognize him from the episode with Pleasure Trove with Shaba and then also the penis decorating biscuits. Jamie has a PhD and his thesis was on patterns of genital sexual arousal in transgender men. Take it away, Jamie. Hello, my name is Jamie, uh, I'm a transgender man, and I did a PhD looking into the well-being, development, and arousal of trans people. Today I'm going to be talking about the arousal component of my research and what we found in the Human Sexuality Lab when we looked into the genital arousal patterns of transgender men. This is a topic area that has been well researched among cisgender men and cisgender women, comparing the two groups to each other quite often, with a reliable difference found in patterns of genital sexual arousal between cisgender groups. As a quick overview, cisgender men will typically show category-specific genital arousal, whereby they will show arousal only to a gender that they state they're attracted to, that matches their sexual orientation. So for example, a straight cisgender man will typically only show genital arousal to women. On the other hand, cisgender women typically show category non-specific arousal, meaning that generally they will show genital arousal to both men and women, regardless of their sexual orientation. This isn't to say they're not actually their sexual orientation though, this is just speaking about their genital arousal. This is where my research came in, and I was interested into whether it's birth sex, or genitals, or gender that plays a role in this difference found in arousal patterns between cisgender men and cisgender women. I also wanted to see where transgender men would fall within this pattern, so I decided to measure the genital sexual arousal of transgender men and compare it to the arousal of cisgender men and cisgender women. Now just to clarify, measuring genital arousal in this way is done in complete privacy for the people taking part in the research. It's in a soundproof, private, closed off booth. In the lab, we measured genital arousal in one one of two ways, and this depended on the genitals that participants had. For people with vaginas, a vaginal probe was used, and this measures vaginal pulse amplitude, so basically the blood flow going on down there whilst people are watching videos, and increased pulse amplitude means arousal. For people with penises, a penile circumference gauge was used, and this very simply, it's like a fancy rubber band, and it just stretches and measures changes in penile circumference. So people are sat in a private booth, they're given instructions on how to use the genital measurement devices, and they then watch porn, solo porn videos, whilst their genital arousal is measured. There's also then some lovely David Attenborough nature documentary videos shown between each porn clip to return people to baseline arousal. In my research, I had a total of 25 transgender men take part, some of which used the vaginal probe, and some of which used the penile gauge if they'd had a certain type of bottom surgery called metoidioplasty. Additionally, there were 145 cisgender men and 178 cisgender women that took part as well. Overall, we found that transgender men showed more male typical arousal patterns, so their arousal patterns were more in line with those of cisgender men because their arousal patterns matched their sexual orientation. For example, if a transgender man reported attraction solely to women, then we found the strongest genital arousal to women and transgender men attracted to men showed the strongest arousal to videos showing men, and this is in line with what we'd expect to find in cisgender men. Where transgender men differ to cisgender men is that they showed stronger arousal to a non-preferred gender than cisgender men do, but this was not as strong as cisgender women. Finally, we found that the penile gauge was a valid measure of arousal in trans men who have had metoidioplasty, which I think was pretty cool. Then when it came to the effect of transition stage, on the genital arousal patterns of transgender men, so whether they started testosterone and how long they've been on testosterone, the results were pretty consistent across all participants, regardless of the stage they were at. We had 20 participants take part who were on testosterone, and five take part who had not started testosterone yet, and there were no reliable or significant differences found in the genital arousal patterns between these two groups. However, the participant sample of five who had not started testosterone was too small to draw any kind of conclusions into the effect of testosterone, but it does kind of appear like there's not much of an effect going on, but a larger sample group would be needed to reinvestigate this. I think it's important to include trans people in research like this. It's something that was so researched among cisgender groups, and I just think the more information we have about people, the less ignorance there will be, and the less ignorance there will be, the less transphobia there will be. And also, there's a lot of transphobia at the minute that is just making things up and shouting things out into the world and spreading a lot of misinformation, and I think it's always good to be able to fall back on findings and science and facts to rebut 
the falsehoods that are being said. Saying that, I never did do this research as a way to prove trans men's identities or trans men being men, because trans men are men regardless of what these results would say, but I do think it's really a very cool finding that they do show male typical patterns in their genital arousal. That was always thought of as a biological difference between cisgender men and cisgender women, but the fact that trans men have shown this pattern that is like cis men is really quite cool and it sheds a lot of light on this specific research field, not just in terms of trans people, but also in terms of the differences found between cis people. So it further supports that these differences in patterns found between cis men and cis women are not down to the measurement device used, and that a person's gender opposed to their genitals or birth sex may play a role in the differences found in genital arousal patterns. And that's my research in a nutshell. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. Thank you so much, Jamie. I think it is amazing that this research is being done and hopefully we will see lots more trans inclusive sex research in the future. So now we know what genital non-concordance is and that it's totally normal, what can we do to make sure it doesn't mess with our sex lives? If you can't make your own WAP, store-bought is fine. Or how to bridge the gap between subjective arousal and genital response. In this section, we're mostly going to talk about when you're subjectively aroused and you are into sex, but your genitals aren't responding. First up, lube. We love lube here. There is no shame in using lube. Yes, the vagina is self-lubricating, but sometimes you just need a little extra help. And if you can't make your own lube, then store-bought is fine. Keeping lube in a bedside drawer, along with condoms, your go-to sex toys, and any other sex essentials can be really helpful. Good to have everything close to hand, you know? And while it may feel awkward at first, there is no shame in asking for lube or bringing lube to sex dates. It can make sex feel really good, and if you're having sex with someone, they're probably invested in that sex feeling good for you, hopefully. It's also okay to just accept that some sex acts might not be possible, but there are plenty of other things on the sex menu. So if you can't do penetration, you can focus on oral sex or touch. Maybe explore some prostate play or grab some sex toys, or just have a lovely kiss and a cuddle. I talked in my most recent Hormone Diaries episode that penetration is off the sex menu for me right now, but I still consider my sex life to be really good at the moment. It's very easy to feel shame when our bodies don't work in the way that we were taught they should, and that shame isn't helpful for subjective arousal or genital response. Sometimes taking certain sex acts off the table can remove the pressure and allow you and your partner to focus on intimacy and connection. And sometimes when your genitals aren't being expected to perform, they suddenly start responding. Of course, if you're finding vaginal penetration painful or you're struggling to get or maintain an erection long term, it might be worth booking an appointment with your doctor or a psychosexual therapist. I've done videos about vaginismus and erectile dysfunction before, but if these are things that are causing you distress, then it is absolutely okay to seek out professional help. Also, the nightmare of a capitalist society that we live in really pushes us to disconnect from our bodies and to ignore our body's signs and cues in favor of being productive. Because genital non-concordance is so frequently psychological, reconnecting with our bodies might really help. There's a thing called sensate focus, which is a kind of mindfulness practice designed to bring us back into our bodies. It's a set of exercises built around touching yourself or your partner, but not with the aim for any arousal or orgasm or penis and vagina sex. It's just to touch, to notice those sensations and be present in your body. And it's important to remember that you should only carry on having sex, whatever that looks like for you, if you want to. You can stop at any time. It's totally okay to decide that you don't want anything off the sex menu, that you are done and you just want to chill and watch Netflix instead. Our genitals not responding in the way that they're supposed to or the way that we would like them to doesn't mean the sex has to end. But equally, it doesn't mean that you have to grab the lube and grimly continue if you don't want to. Sex shouldn't feel like a chore. Has this been yet another video where I break down a bunch of shoulds and myths and bullshit around sex and then tell you all to communicate with each other? Yes, I think it has been. I hope that you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two about 
genital non-concordance and subjective sexual arousal. Shout out to sex writer Quinn Rhodes for his work on researching and writing the script for this video. And thank you so much to my patrons who support this channel and the sex education work that I do. If you would like to join our community of sex nerds, we are a lovely bunch, I promise, then the link to join and support this channel is in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.